Welcome, both of you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Wow. Okay. So, Yancy, I just have to say that literally just watching the trailer almost brought me to tears. And um, because also, like, there was this flood of, like, you know, uh, kudos to you and your producer for tracking down some of these people, you know, because I remember seeing these stories, you know, like on Instagram, on Facebook, to the extent that like, I actually had to take a break from social media, um, uh, definitely during the pandemic, and I'm literally like baby stepping, but I can, I can, um, I don't have to be on Twitter anymore. We can. Oh, no, none of us have to be on Twitter anymore. That's Twitter is over. Right. Yeah. Even though I have a little blue check, I'm I am out of there. Right. 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 Um, that was a joke. Yeah. But you know, I was thinking, like, who is this film for? Sure. You know, like, who's the audience for? Because I was well aware. You know, I live. Yeah. That that's right. reality. That's right? right. I'm like talking to my you know, like here in Atlanta or, you know, in Georgia, people were just wilding out like it wasn't happening. But because I had lived in New York, I was like, oh no, you can't come to my house. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Mm -hmm. Wear your mask, double, triple mask, you know, all that stuff. Um, So if you could just kind of like walk us through that. Of course. Well, I think that, I think, first of all, thank you. Thank you to the World Newsreel um, for, for showing the film, for hosting us, for having us. Um, you know, there were, there were, there were a couple of audiences in mind, right? The the first audience is the folks for whom what's happening in healthcare and what was happening during COVID is not news, right? The folks who are, the folks who are living these experiences. One of the things that I think is really important is that we see those stories reflected in documentary work about the pandemic reflected Mm -hmm. back at us Mm -hmm. so that it's clear that you are not alone you are not making things up you are not imagining that it is that it is as bad as documented it's documented right like like you know it's it's kind of like evidence of life in a hostage Mm -hmm. situation Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. it's Mm -hmm. like so part of what i wanted the film to do was was to provide evidence of people's experience mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um the other you know the other goal of the film was to you know there are multiple frequencies in this country right and so documentary work like every other form of media has to function on multiple frequencies and there was a frequency mm-hmm. on you know uh, you know in our society of people who don't know what it's like not mm-hmm. to get quality health care Okay. And, and, and so for me, you know, one of the things, and, and it's one of the reasons why we drilled down so, um, so specifically with facts and figures and data, one of the things was to, you know, hopefully be able to say to people who have a very different experience, mm. um, that there was a whole nother side to our healthcare industry. And I refer to it as an industry because it is profit it is driven, it, it is not definitely. wellness driven, right? Um, there, there is another side to the healthcare industry that that you are fortunate enough not to encounter, but you need to know about this. And you know, I I would hope at the end of the at the end of the film be moved to try to make a change um, for the better for everyone who has to seek healthcare in this country. Mm-hmm. No, absolutely. Um, a shameless plug is that I'm producing a film called The Only Doctor. Mm. Um, shot in on Clay County, Georgia, mm. you know, like the nearest hospital is 40 miles away. And that's yep. actually in Alabama. The The nearest hospital in Georgia is 60 miles away. And we filmed during the pandemic, right? So like, yep. I complete, I like get it on multiple levels, you know, like, what does it mean to be near the hospital, but then can't get in? That's right. Right. And then and because also um, Albany was like one of the epicenters. Albany, Georgia. Explosive explosion places, you know, outside of, you know, New York and L.A. Right. And, you know, like 60 cases like mushroom mushroomed over like night, you know, and um, they were 
you know, bless everybody's hearts, ill, Ill prepared. But then here in Georgia, like, you know, somebody from Albany, right? Yeah. Like everybody doesn't, didn't know someone from New York or LA, but they did know somebody like who was touched by, by the situation in Albany. Right. Mm. And, um, so I was just thinking that, um, I'm like, I don't need the film per se, but I also get like, actually, you know, um, based on histo history, yeah. if you don't document, you like, yeah. act like, hey, like that didn't exist. You're like, actually it did. I was there for that, right? right. But it's almost like now we have proof because right. we wrote it down, so to speak, right? Exactly. Yeah, and then are you all using the film for um, for like pol you know to you know affect change in terms of policy or like is there you know like what is the impact campaign around sure. that? So I've I've been to Washington D.C. Um, you know the the characters in the film um, you know were there with me um, meeting with members of the Congressional Black Caucus. Um, and, you know, the, the film, you know, and with the, with the work that the Smithsonian Channel um, put in to the, the outreach campaign, you okay. know, has been trying to reach people who have the power to make change on the national policy level. Um, but also, you know, the film was meant to be shown in medical schools to mm. people who are just learning how to be doctors mm. so that they wouldn't pick up the bad habits of the people um, mm -hmm. who are teaching them, which is not to say that they have nothing to teach them, but it, it, but it is to say that there are some things that you should not pass on to your students, and racial bias is one of them. Um, so, you know, medical schools, um, policymakers, um, physicians um, who've, who've been in practice for, for so long that they might not be aware um, of their own biases, um, mm -hmm. and, and also mm -hmm. Black doctors, you know, like one of the groups in, featured in the film is the Philadelphia-based Black Doctors COVID-19 Consortium. They started, you know, as a group of, of doctors who knew one another, who pooled all of the, the COVID testing kits that they had set up shop in a church parking lot um, just to, to bring testing to a community that didn't otherwise have access to testing. Um, so, you know, we're, we're trying to make sure that the film is seen by you know by by all of the people who could take different things away from it um, and use it in in the places where they where they are. Right, right. No, I uh, I can I can definitely um, see that. And I was also thinking about you know you just mentioned you know like talking with doctors and different people and different stakeholders. Mm. And I was thinking about like Linda Viorosa, who yep. actually wrote you know wrote a book right yeah, yeah. um ab ab about this and also looking at um you know so i i love that it's going to actually go to doctors because there is like these different assumptions and then that's also not to say that black and brown people also don't like take take something away from that because you know the col colonized mind never sleeps you know right. like these like, these colonial views you know never sleep yeah. right and we sometimes ingest them without really knowing it and without like questioning right so yeah. um, so I was thinking that and and so then I had this idea of like why or not why I know why but talk a little bit or if you could talk a little bit about like the use of experts as sure. opposed to just hearing the stories because you know um you know uh I'm thinking about um the one that really tore me up was about the um the bus driver from Detroit because yes. I remember seeing his thing like I remember distinctly like being out for my daily walk yeah. watching his video and just be like, yeah, brother, I hear you. I hear you. This is crazy. Yeah. And then literally being devastated yeah. to hear that he had passed, right? Yeah. Like that one, like gut checked me, right? And so, but so then do we need these, who are these other people to like tell us, you know, beyond the statistics, because we're hearing from experts, mm -hmm. so to speak, like who do we, who are we centering as experts? Sure. So I think that one of the one of the things that I want that I want to make really clear 
um, as a deliberate choice that I made for the mm -hmm. film is that all of the experts in the film are people of color. Okay. There are no, yep. there are no white experts in this film, um, in part because there don't need to be white experts in this mm. film, right? People mm. of color um, are, are bearing the brunt of COVID-19 mm -hmm. disproportionately. And so what I, what I wanted to do was to make sure that I was presenting factual information, historical analysis, mm -hmm. um, as well as contemporary um, frameworks mm -hmm. around COVID-19 from the positionality of, of physicians of color who, right. have, who have been through institutions that are predominantly white in order to go mm. to law school, right? Okay. And so they okay. understand they understand the bias that, that is built into medical education. Mm -hmm. They understand the bias that's built into the practice of medicine because they've witnessed it firsthand. Um, and so one of the things that I thought was that I thought was important um, was to show the audience a, a, a panel of experts of color, and to and to put those people in the positions of in, in a position of authority, right? Um, as much as you know, like as many documentary films as, as you and I have seen, um, you know, almost all the experts are always white. Um, I thought it was really important to shift that 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 lens um, because the pandemic shifted its focus disproportionately on communities of color. So I wanted doctors of color to be able to mm. speak about the, the pandemic and about COVID-19 and what was happening in the country um, from their unique perspectives. No, absolutely. I, I mean, I, I completely get that. And um, because, you know, um, I think that like YouTube or had something like that where like it was like doctors of color, yep. like speaking to the community and like yep. those are the people I clicked on, you know, um, yep. along with Dr. Fauci, right? But Right. Just, Doctors like, of color plus Dr. Fauci. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But we can also center someone else. And, and it just made me think of like when I I was at CNN and I, you know, I was pitching different doctors and yeah. I was like, I'm pitching the people that I want to see, yep. you know, and it and I remember like such pushback. And I'm yes. like, what are you talking? They're also a doctor. They're head of cardiology. Like, what is the problem? Exactly. Exactly. You Thankfully, know? the partners that I had in creating this in, in creating this film at Harpo, um, they 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 embraced my choices, um, you know, of experts um, and of families, um, you know, um, that we featured in the film. So I, I did not have to fight that battle. Um, sure. But it's it, but it's so important. Um, you can never, um, in my in my mind, you can never pass up an opportunity to center the voice of of experts who are outside of cis het white male um, yeah. because we need to be able to we need to recalibrate the, the the notion of who an expert or what an expert looks like and so for me that was why we made the you know the choice of the people that we did is because i want to deliberately recalibrate everyone's idea mm -hmm. of what an expert looks like Right. No, thank you. And thank you. Thank sure. you. So you kind of touched on it. So um, in, in your last answer, which is thinking about, okay, so you were making, so spill the tea. What's it like working for Ops? So um, working for Oprah Winfrey is, it is a remarkable experience. Um, you know, I will I will say that um, the first time that I met with her and her team, it was on Zoom. This this film was made during the pandemic. Right. So right. everything happened remotely. We weren't wow. able to get the kind of verite footage that we might otherwise have gotten um, from our subjects because no one would let that would let us in their house. Wow. Um, you know, there there were really strict rules um, and protocols about shooting in terms of how how long, you know, we could keep a cameraman and a sound person or a cinematographer rather and a sound person inside a location before wait we a minute, wait a minute. out for ventilation. When, when did you all like you you, you shot in 2020 or 2021 or we were like shooting in August, August through December of 2020. Okay. So we were we were we were shooting in places, and actually we had to cancel um, a shoot with one character who was based in Cleveland 
because there was a spike in COVID cases about a week before we were supposed to be there. And it just would have been irresponsible for me to bring, you know, two people from New York plus an entire crew, um, a Cleveland based crew um, together, you know, into, you know, a, a, a public school setting mm. without, you know, knowing, you know, the, the, the potential impact of, of what that decision would mean. Sure. Um, so, you know, shooting during the pandemic was, was intense. Um, and it meant that our choices were, 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 were curtailed by COVID, you know, safety precautions. Um, but Ms. Winfrey is, um, she's an incredible mind. Um, she understands the power of storytelling. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, from, from my perspective, um, when she read the story about Gary Fowler and knew that she wanted to do, um, a film about his story and stories like his, um, you know, from my perspective, it was only a matter of time. Um, and I happened to have worked on, the Apple mental health series that she executive produced. Mm -hmm. um, so she already knew of my work. Um, and, and that's how I got um, connected to her um, and, and initially spoke with her about doing this film. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I, I, I pitched my idea about it like anybody else. And, you know, mm -hmm. one of the things that I said to her that I think really resonated was that I'm tired of, um, I'm tired of, of trying to appeal to people's hearts and minds. Right. Okay. I'm I'm really tired of the hearts and minds thing. Like mm. I, I, I'm, I, it's it's like that hearts and mind time is over as far as I'm concerned. This has to be about fundamental change because it needs to stop. Right. Because people are dying. Because you know doctors who are asking for pain medication, and you know Facebook streaming their experiences from the hospital and then going home and dying afterward. Like folks like that are real. They are not imaginary, right? Um, the maternal health rate and the infant mortality rate for African-Americans in this country is abysmal. Yeah. And so, you know, like yeah. we have been trying the hearts and mind, uh, hearts and minds tactic, mm. you know, for I'm not sure how long, but it's not going to work. If it were going to work, it would have already worked. Right. right? Now, is, you know, from my perspective, telling the story needed to rely on hard facts and information mm. and that's why there's so much information in the film because mm -hmm. I wanted it to be clear that you might not know about this but you can't deny that these things happen and that and that this situation is true right it's like well you know you know like the naysayers can like dismiss one or two things but you're like but here's a list of a hundred yes you know so like which one are you gonna like so like, you know, let me get some popcorn as you try to pick apart each thing, but like, you know, around 50, like it's undeniable. Right. Right. Um, exactly. Yeah. And, and I was, I was thinking, I was like, Mamie Till, um, yep. exactly. you know, um, we, you, you will not be able to look away. You know, you have to um, see what is happening and, and acknowledge it. Right. And then exactly. now we can, now we can get to work. Exactly. I mean, that, that's the thing, you know, and, and I presumed that there would be all kinds of people watching this film, um, including, you know, people of color who did not know some of the statistics that, that are, that are in the piece. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, everything about the GFCR um, test for kidney function, right? Um, and, and, and the way that that is biased toward, um, or rather biased, biased against African-Americans, because there's this differential, um, that they include in your score that could potentially hide, uh, kidney failure, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? And so like, just, just, just unearthing little facts like that you know, down to things that we weren't able to get into the, into the film, which is, you know, a medical student sort of casting doubt on whether or not um, pulse oximeters are able to read melanated skin accurate, you know, the oxygen levels in melanated skin, through, mel through melanated skin accurately. Mm -hmm. there's, there's still some debate about whether or not these pulse oximeters, which we're all supposed to like, you know, track our oxygen levels to make sure that we don't need to go to the hospital. If you've got melanin, it might not work accurately. Oh, wow. 
you know, so, yeah. and, 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 and melanin is not just black folks. Melanin right. is, is, the melanin is a whole spectrum of people. Right. Right. So there's, there's all sorts of information um, that we put into the film that we thought was really, really necessary for people to be able to walk away with. Right. Um, one of the things that, uh, that really, um, hmm. that I was thinking about over and over is this, the idea of archive yeah, and like also like the documentation yeah, and, you know, um, through the photos, um, you know, the, the um, well, just all the archive because people had social media footage, yep. you know, and, and, and that sort of thing. So if you could, you know, really talk a little bit about like, in in some ways, like creating the archive, but then also having people present their own archive. Sure, T either is, is about to or, or has just finished conducting an experiment um, on an enslaved um, black woman. Um, and, you know, some of the other images of, um, you know, uh, people in China and at the beginning of the pandemic and, you know, things that you might see on the news and, and, and or, um, you know, just like more, tr more traditional historical, you know, mm -hmm, archive, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, which, you know, we got through, we, we got through requesting the material through an, an archival house and then, and then they sent it to us and, or we licensed photographs and that kind of thing. Um, and then there's the personal archive. Um, and one of the things that I realized um, really quickly um, about um, people um, and the way that they document their lives is that everything was digital. You know, we asked folks for, for photographs and they emailed pictures to us from their phones. Right. Like nobody has actual photographs anymore. Right. Um, you know, like the, the, yeah. um, the little, the video of Shalandra, um, Rollins, um, you know, is, is, is from her, her mother's cell phone. Um, because that's how people document themselves mm -hmm, mm -hmm. these days. So, you know, it was it was a really humbling experience to, you know, sort of open your inbox and have a new batch of archival material from from someone of of pictures that you know of of their loved one who was gone. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that kind of thing is really um, intense, and and just to and even the process. And the care with which you have to ask people to share photographs um, is is also it's it's a very deliberate thing. It's a very sensitive thing. Mm -hmm. It needs to be done with respect and care. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, so collecting that personal archive from the people who were in the film who lost loved ones um, was a slow and deliberate process, but it it really resulted in us being able to paint a picture of each of the people who'd been lost. Um, that we would we would otherwise not have been able to do with, without the personal archives. Right, right. I was I was thinking that um, we get to know them beyond the headline, mm -hmm. you know, through the through the personal archive, right? Yeah. And um, so then that brings me to you know you just spoke about care. You're you're speaking about like the care that you gave to you know to the participants to your collaborators, right? Yeah. Um, and but then I'm also like, what was the care for you and your team? You know, because I got re-traumatized, mm. right? But you, you know, somebody's got to sit in the edit and watch it again and watch it again and yeah. watch it again, right? Yeah. So like, what was, you know, what were you all doing or how did you take care of yourself and for your crew? Were there, you know, did you all have any rituals? Did you do a retreat? So we had all of these restrictions in place and everyone I think was, was in a caretaking mode because we were trying so hard and, and, we, and we succeeded. Um, we were trying so hard to you know to avoid anybody on the true on the crew contracting covid mm -hmm. you know so we you know there were there were all sorts of accommodations that we had to make for the crew everybody you know had to have a you know had to have their meals in their hotel rooms when they were on the road mm -hmm. um you know we we flew into atlanta and drove to jackson mississippi 
to avoid having to, you know, having take to transfer planes. at the Atlanta yeah. airport and take more than one plane. Right. Um, you know, so there were there were all sorts of things that were that we were doing to take care of ourselves um, because of COVID mm -hmm. that I think really helped um, soften, you know, all of the information that we were getting from these families mm -hmm. um, because we were, you know, we were not we were not in the kind of situation where, you know, sometimes, you know, when you're shooting at the wrap and a couple hours later, you know, folks might meet in the hotel bar for a beer, you know, and, and, and to, you know, to decompress. That was not the case, you know, um, with this, it was, everybody was in their rooms. And I think that because we had this required separation, it built in a level of quiet time mm. and a level of rest and recharging that we might not have otherwise gotten. Mm. Um, and you know, and the edit was intense. You know, the, there's 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 no doubt about the there's no doubt about it. There's mm -hmm. you know, there's something about watching these stories and and having the ability to make a separation and think of them as stories, so that you can actually edit a film that makes right. you know sense narratively and and, right. and has an arc and etc. Um, but then you know, at the end of the day, you snap back and 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 you're a human being again. And, you know, you wonder why you're exhausted and it's just like, oh, right, because I've been doing this for eight hours, you know, right. um, but I, I, we did, we did as good a job as we could to, you know, taking care of ourselves. Um, and, and given that the fact that the, the pandemic was raging and we had no idea what was going to happen, you know, from day to day, um, I, I'm really proud of the way that we, that we made it through. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um... Thank you for that. And um, yeah, because I was um, thinking, I was like watching it. I was like, wait a minute. Did they like really just like start like right when everything was happening? Because so many of these things were happening like right at the beginning when people didn't know what was going on. Right. That's right. That's right. Um, yeah, I was I was thinking about that. And so yeah. And so like, so people were drinking their beer by themselves in their rooms. Yeah. Watching, back, going back, going, going to bed early, <laughs> you know, getting the right amount of sleep, you know, exactly. Because all of the usual crew hangout stuff just wasn't, just wasn't in the cards. Yeah, just wasn't happening. Right. Yeah. So um, I also have something I wanted to ask about yeah. the graphics. Yes. And the music. Yes. yes. So like who's, you know, so on one hand, you know, I've been following your career. So, you know, definitely Strong Island is one we show every semester. So talk to Thank Netflix you. and be like, where's my check? I know that at least 14, 30 people watch my film every semester. So come on. I wish it, I wish it worked like that. There's, there's no such thing as residuals with oh. Netflix. It's, it's all good though. It's all good. I'm, okay. I'm well, happy. we watch it every time. And you know, it's, it, you know, it's available for free on YouTube, right? Oh. The Netflix has a Black Lives, they, has a Black all, Lives Matter channel. Have, they, oh, YouTube. so thank you for everybody else. But yeah, all right. the students have Netflix or have access to Netflix. Got it. So, um, but yes, thank you. Thank you for, for that. Cause I do recommend, I also recommend it too. Um, thank you. Faves. Um, but because you know like like the graphics kind of reminded me like had a little strong island flavor but very different very different and also the fact that you know like this orchestral kind of music was used which i yeah. thought was like like runs kind of counter to the stories that you're telling yeah. so or, or the people or kind of runs counter to the yeah, to the stories that you're telling and also the people that you're telling in the in environments that you're telling it. So sure. if you could talk a little bit about that, please. Of course, yeah. So the music that you hear in the trailer is actually very different from the score of the film. Mm. The, the score of the film is done by an African-American man named Robert Lowe, L-O-W-E. Um, mm. He's a brilliant composer. Um, he did the score to Candyman. Um, and Robert... <sighs> Robert Lowe uses a lot of the human voice in his score. He uses a lot of instruments that are outside of the of the string instrument world um, in his scoring. Um, he uses a lot of uh, of generated sound 
mm -hmm. slash noise in his composing. Mm. Um, you know, Robert is is the kind of artist who is is just able to make music um, from from unexpected objects. Um, so what you hear in that trailer is actually it's a very different. I mean, it's 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 good trailer music, but it's mm -hmm. not the same score as 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 the predominant score in the film. Um, and I and I love the score in the film because it it works to integrate itself into the the background of what's happening and it tries and it tries to it tries to elevate the content as opposed to compete with the content mm -hmm. um, and I think it really achieves that well um, the graphics you know it's, it's my first time using graphics as heavily as I did in this film um, and in this way um, you know but there was no other um, you know, there was no other way to to communicate some of the information that we needed to, and and just kind of keeping it in a hand drawn style, um, you you know, using the the red font throughout, mm -hmm. um, and you know, just it working with the company um, that did the graphics, Imaginary Forces, um, you know, it, it was an it was an interesting experience for me because I I'm not used to leaning into graphics as heavily, mm -hmm. um, but I do think that the graphics succeeded in sort of closing this closing the circle um, mm -hmm. on the story and connecting the experts and the families and the information mm -hmm. um, and and I and I like them actually I was just like oh yeah those aren't those aren't bad those are really good um, at the at the end of it all so I'm I'm happy with them right thank you. Um, uh, just FYI, we did put the link to um, you, your YouTube link into the chat. Great. And um, so we have a couple of questions, okay. which is, you know, will there be a second part? Is this a web series or is this a one-off? It's a one-off. It's a one-off. Um, it was conceived as a one-off. Um, and, you know, so much has changed about COVID and the pandemic since we since we made the film, I think that if we were to do a second part, um, it would it would really focus on um, if I were to do a second part, it would focus on data and the fact that the CDC was not tracking COVID deaths um, at the beginning of the pandemic in January when people were dying of a mysterious disease in the United States. The CDC was not keeping track of the numbers. Right, they didn't start tracking. Death, they didn't start tracking COVID deaths until April or maybe May. So, but is, you know. is was that the um, the red something guy, the guy who was put in charge from um, from um, uh, or was that Walensky? Oh, was I don't the, remember. Was I don't she remember. already in, or there was the other guy, uh, the guy that Trump put in charge of, like the CDC? That's a good question. Whoever was in charge of the CDC in January of 2020 is a person um, who, you know, who dropped the ball on, on the Definitely. data, which is, which is why all of the estimates that you hear about the number of COVID um, deaths in the United States are undercounts. You know, yeah. the, the person who's now the White House advisor on COVID-19, Dr. Ashish Jha, who's in the film, mm -hmm. um, you know, he, one of the things that he said was, um, you know, that one of the worst things that happened during COVID is that the, the United States did not track the number of people who were dying. And so the real impact, the actual number of people who've died of COVID will, will, will never truly be known um, because they were also, um, you know, classifying people who, who died of secondary conditions they were they were classifying their cause of death as the secondary condition, not right. not uh, you know right. as as uh, as a death caused by COVID. Right. Um, so if I were to, you know if I were to do another um, you know installment of this um, project, it would it would be about that. Um, but but this film is meant to you know to stand on its own mm -hmm. um, and to you know to try to educate people and also to try to affirm people's experience. Right, mm -hmm. and really wanted it to affirm mm. the experience of, of people who were going through it during COVID when nobody was watching, right? right. When nobody cared, right? When you know when the when the news was talking about every every place else except where you lived, 
right. right i wanted i want this film to to um to really lift those people up and 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 let them know that you know that they were not forgotten during all this sure so i get that this film is about like what was happening yep. you know like in many ways like during the height of, of the of the pandemic or certainly mm -hmm. you know like where we were at the peak and then like this part here so but you know someone asked about like long covid you know that it just seems like that's just you know not it's not a part of this this film but like could that be something for going forward or like there's no going for it you know um yeah it's up I, to miss oh miss miss winfrey whether or not she wants to do something else so miss winfrey is really focused on health disparities and okay. ending and ending health disparities in our in in healthcare. okay um, that, that was her focus um you know, we happen to come together at a time when the predominant issue facing American healthcare was COVID-19. So mm -hmm. the, 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 the issue of health disparities and COVID-19 overlapped in a way that we could not have anticipated. Mm -hmm. if, if it hadn't been COVID-19, it might have been a very different film. Um, but her focus is on, is on ending healthcare, you know, disparities in healthcare. Okay. Um, you know, long COVID wasn't a thing when we were making mm -hmm. this film because it was so early in the pandemic. Um, you know, people weren't even, you know, like people were still debating about whether or not you needed to wear a mask, um, you know, when, when we were shooting. And, you know, because of union rules, you know, like we were we were masked and, and doing all sorts of other things um, to to, you know, to keep our sets safe. Um, but, you know, the it the point of the film is to really focus on healthcare disparities and 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 the long story of you know mistreatment by the healthcare industry of many people of color in this country so then the question is has the needle moved because i mean we have you know serena Beyonce, yep. you know, That's are right. also talking about these things. I'm making a movie about rural health care, right? Yep. So like, is the needle moving, you know, or it, will there has to be kind of like this um, where things come together in some other, you know, like this was a perfect storm and like you still didn't move your ass. Right, right. Right. Um, right. Like this, think... this was it, you know? Right. You know, it's hard to know if the, if the needle is moving just yet because a couple of things, um, you know, haven't happened. The generation of doctors who are being trained now during COVID-19 where health disparities were kind of like the covers were kind of pulled back on mm -hmm. health disparities for everybody to see. Those people aren't practicing medicine yet. They're still in, in medical school. So the, the changes that they might bring to the, health, the healthcare industry in the United States are, are to be determined. Um, you know what they absorb from from the from the COVID nineteen crisis and the disproportionate impact on people of color of COVID nineteen and healthcare disparities is to be determined. Um, I think it's also a little bit tough to to measure progress because there is no national standard of measurement. Mm. You know we don't like we have the CDC and they and they track a lot of things, but there is no you know, there, there is no centralized way of, of being able to take all of the data and say, we're going to look at this, we're going to look at that, we're going to look at the other thing. Mm -hmm. And from, from these pieces, extrapolate this, the state of healthcare for people of color in this country. There, there's nothing like that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and until the, you know, the federal government or some, you know, well-endowed um, nonprofit decides to go into the business of of aggregating data in a way that enables people to tell the story of healthcare in this country it's going to be really tough to know um mm. you know if things and maybe are that's like intentional pharmaceutical companies well, you know there's 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 there's, <laughs> there's accidents and then there's intention right, right? 
And I, and I think that when things happen long enough, you have to move on from the accidents and realize that it's the intention. Right. But I think that there are, you know, like the whole white coats for black lives, Matt, for white coats for black lives mm -hmm. movement is remarkable. Mm -hmm. And like it was started by, med by medical students um, after the death, I believe of Michael Brown. Um, and it's still active, you know, on, on, on college campuses and, and at medical schools across the country today. Um, and so that is one place where change is really visible, yeah. right? When you, have, when you have medical students walking out of class and, you know, and, and taking a knee and doing, thank you for putting that link in, um, uh, in, the, in the chat, you know, that's some of the ways in which you can see change happening because those, those doctors, those students are close to graduation. And they're yep. going to take their personal philosophies with them to wherever they wind up practicing. Mm. So if they go into individual mm. practice, it's going with them. If they go right. into practice at a hospital, it's going with them. Right. Um, and hopefully the, some of those people will then go on to teach new students how to be doctors. And some of the things that have you know, resulted in healthcare disparities will begin to drop away. Sure. So, um, uh, uh, to be continued, so to Indeed. speak, right? You know, it's Absolutely. like, oh, okay, so hang on a few years and then we can start to see, you know, the needle changing. And so I love the idea that like, actually it's not, you know, we've, to to your point, like we've tried, like, you know, the hearts and minds with current policymakers. Okay, you're not, you're not doing it. Okay, no right. problem. We're going to start with the babies, you know, and like, bring them along and then they will you know won't know any different right because right, they exactly. have learned this and so then they're just they're just moving in that in that way right? there's the, there's yeah there's the, there is the there is the inevitability of time right if if nothing else um there will be a day when when the doctors who have who have caused um, such, you know, grievous health care disparities will no longer be with us. They will no longer be, be, be practicing medicine. Mm. Um, there's a generational, you know, turnover mm. that has to happen in medicine. Mm -hmm. um, and hopefully, you know, when, as that turnover happens, that will also be one of the things that contributes to the end of, of health care mm -hmm. disparities. So um, we're going to wrap out with Mario's questions, which is, you know, could you share thoughts about mis, um, misinformation and or disinformation also impacted communities of color, you know, sure. it's expressed through the film, through the stories, um, you know, so that's question one. Uh, sure. Are you able to, you're able to see the chat because you saw that white, white coats for Black Lives was in there. Um, so, you know, I think it's really interesting that we know now how, how much, um, you know, countries like Russia was um, was working to or were working to um, sow disinformation in communities of color, right? Like deliberately starting rumors about COVID um, that would result in people not seeking care, mm -hmm. deliberately sowing um, doubt about the science so that people would, you know, think back to moments in our history like Tuskegee and, and be afraid that the the vaccine was not safe or the vaccine was an experiment. Um, you know, I, I think it's I think it's really important to remember that we know we know now where those rumors came from, right? Mm. And it's not you know Russia doesn't Russia doesn't care if I live or die, mm -hmm. right? Russia has an agenda you know about sowing discord in the United States, mm -hmm. and you know one of the things that Russia did was to target communities of color with with disinformation, and then because the internet is a cesspool, it gets magnified, right? And and people don't know how to tell you know fact from fiction because everything looks the same, right? You know, um, so one of the things that that we saw is that people would, you know, people had thought one thing about COVID and then if they got sick or if they knew someone who got sick, they would, they would realize that what they thought about COVID was completely wrong, right? But what, what we also realized in making the film is that people knew about health disparities 
And they knew to expect, because they had experienced it before, poor treatment from the healthcare system. And the healthcare system did not disappoint, even at a time of national crisis. Right. The healthcare right. system did what the healthcare system always does, sure. which is deliver substandard care to people of color on a regular basis. Yeah. So people expected that. They didn't expect COVID. Right. So they 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 knew the facts about about um about healthcare disparities. They didn't realize that you know that it was that it was as bad for as long, but they knew about it. They realized because they, you know, go to the doctor, you, you get treated, you know, like a black person or you get treated like a brown person, right? And right. that means that you don't get treated like you're white. Um, and that level of care is just not available to you and I. Sure. Right. Sure. So, um, you know, the, the misinformation about COVID was one thing, but, but people's personal experiences with the healthcare system is what drove um, you know, their, their experiences, um, during COVID-19, they, yeah. they, they knew, they knew that they were being treated poorly. They, they knew. Sure. I was thinking about how, you know, uh, we know which, you know, like literally you can be like being wheeled into the ambulance and you're like, they're like, we're going to take you to such and such hospital. Like, right. you're saying, no, you're not <laughs> like, literally you would take off the, the oxygen and be like, do not take me there. Take That's me right. to such and such. And They're like, you you're not going to make me, it. You're like, I'm going to hold on so we can get to this other hospital. I will That's hold right. on. Or I'll walk. If you don't want to take, if you don't right. want to take me, let me out. Right, right. You're like, oh no, I'll just drive my loved one. You know, yeah. we'll, not, we'll just take our I live, chance. I live three blocks, four blocks from Elmhurst Hospital, which was the, one, one of the epicenters mm -hmm. of COVID-19, mm -hmm. um, you know, in the city. I'm not going to Elmhurst. Right. I will walk across the 59th Street Bridge to York Avenue and collapse in front of the first hospital I get to um, before I go to Elmhurst. Yeah, yeah, no, um, yeah. So, you know, and I hadn't really thought of it as like, oh, that's also part of this, not yeah. just like once I get to the hospital, but it's also like which hospital, which clinic, what time to go. Like yeah. I've needed to go to the emergency room and I was like, oh, this is a terrible time, right? I will, yeah. I will tough it out here on my couch, set an alarm, and then I'm going to go to the hospital at such and such time when it's a fresh batch of, of, of you know, they've right. already made shift, the shift change. Right, exactly. This person is already bad or exhausted, yeah. you know, like I literally have just like toughed it out and then been like, Okay, now is a good time to go to the hospital. And, and that, your tax dollars go to fund yes. go to fund the institutions that that put you in the position of having to make that choice. And I have health insurance. Like I, you know right. what I'm saying? Yep. And that's um and I I just thought that was like normal. Yeah. Is it yeah. it's normal for our community because like literally I have told people I'm like, "Oh no, we're going to go to such and such place, you know, instead. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, of course. Uh, one other question. Um, did the intersection of other marginalized identities, gender, sexual orientation, et cetera, and it's, um, and its impact on access to care also come up in the stories you heard from participants in the film? Sure. So there, there is um, the the experience of the woman who died in our film, Shalandra Rollins, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, was I think particularly impacted by her gender. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, she's she's the woman who collapsed in her bathroom. Mm -hmm. The EMTs re refused to pick her up. They made her her fiance pick her up. Um, I think that you know the the way that race and gender overlap in in her story are it's in it's inseparable mm -hmm. because if she had been a white woman who collapsed in jackson mississippi and in, in the suburbs right because white folks in jackson don't live in the city they live in the suburbs of jackson mm -hmm. so you know right now in case you guys have been tracking it jackson had a water crisis where yep. the city was out of water the, the white folks in the suburb are now building their own water system 
Mm -hmm. and the black and brown people who live in the city are stuck with the same system that broke down and will likely break again. Mm -hmm. So if Shalandra Rollins had been a white woman in Jackson, she would not have been treated the way that she would not have been left on a gurney in a hallway. Um, and, you know, so from my, from my perspective, race and gender in, in her story are, are inseparable as, as, they, as it often is. Um, one of the things that we did that we also noticed in terms of, of intersectionality um, is that the the statistics for for indigenous Americans, okay. the statistic the statistics for um, for for Latino and Latinx Americans, they, they are they were just a hair's breadth less bad, right? So one of the things that I that I wanted to do, especially in the um, in the graphics, because I don't believe in racing to the bottom, right? I, I don't believe in trying to compete for oppression, right? If you look at the right. statistics in the film, you will see that all of the people of color did really poorly during COVID. Right. Bottom, bottom line, right. full stop. Right. Disproportionate to, to, their, to their percentage of the population. All people of color did really poorly in COVID. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's really important to point out. I was thinking, you know, one of the things that came up as you were just talking is just this idea that um, because no one else was allowed in. Yes. People could do whatever. Yes, that's right. right. Um, that's right. Yeah, Maybe. my mom was in a, um, in, um, in a nursing home. And mm. I was like, I'm coming up there. I was like, I'm getting her out of there. Yep. You know, like I got into straight on shouting matches with yep. people. Um, just they would, you know, because there was no one to could come in and say, why is this woman on a gurney? Why is she still here? You know, there's right. no one to, you had no one to advocate for, right. like nobody was able to advocate for others, right? right? Or, you know, not just for your loved one, but you're not even able to advocate for anybody else, right? you know, because you're not able to be in there and see what is going on. And that like, ultimately, that is the only way to keep people accountable, right? That's right. Even Witnessing. though they have made this oath to do no harm, right? Is um people who work in healthcare are 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 they are in an untenable position. Yeah. They have to see so many patients within such a short period of time. Yep. They have to um they have to make decisions based on whether or not somebody can pay for services. Mm -hmm. Um, and they are overworked, understaffed, and underpaid. Mm -hmm. Right. So the, yeah. the flip side, the flip side of health disparities is that they are magnified by by people who perhaps unintentionally, because they are under such tremendous pressure from so many other forces, make decisions faster than, than they need to, perhaps with less information than they should, um, that may not be fully informed by by your medical history. Um, or, or even, you know, um, the latest research, you know, or, or, or information on, on, you know, particular conditions, people who work inside of the system know how broken it is, right? But they, they have to, because it's like, but they're on a hamster wheel. They can't stop to fix it or else the whole thing comes crashing down. So there is, there's that challenge as well is that how do you fix a system that has to keep going like how do you fix a car while it's while while it's driving uh -huh. you know you have uh -huh. to figure out how to fix a system while it's in motion because we can't stop it right, right? which 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 means that there need to there needs to be kind of like a marshall plan which was the you know europe the the reconstruction plan for europe after world war ii it need, there needs to be a Marshall Plan scale, um, you know, project to fix American healthcare. Mm -hmm. That's what we need. Right, right, right. Like, okay, year one we do this. Exactly. Year two we do this. Like it's like a step ladder. Kind and of here's thing. all of the money. Right. 
here's here's not not here's the debate about how we're going to pay for it here's mm -hmm. all of the money we give the pentagon a trillion dollars a year without without even making a you know a big deal about it right it's not even there's not even a debate right. there's, there's a trillion dollar budget that goes to the pentagon there's there's no there's no reason why we can't have better health care in this country right it's just really about the will that's exactly right it's the will to do it um here's my last question yeah. so um i believe last time i saw you in person so obviously before the pandemic yes yes we we're talking about sustainability yes Yes, like as a as a filmmaker, as a filmmaker. and I'm yep. hearing that even inside of inside of this conversation. Yep. So, um, you know, any new discoveries? Any more up? Op any optimism? Um. So my my model for sustainability is hustling as hard as I can. Right. Like that's I I hustle hard and then I hustle harder. Um. I have agents. Having an agent doesn't make anything easier. I have a manager. Having a manager doesn't make anything easier, right? Um, I come up with project ideas. Um, I'm in post-production on a film about the history of policing in the United States. I came up with that idea. I developed that idea. I pitched that idea to Netflix based on 25 pieces of paper and a lot of other work. They said yes to that project. I have other film, you know, film ideas in the pipeline. I don't have anything greenlit for after the movie I'm working on, mm -hmm. right? So that's the, that's the thing. It's like there are some folks in our industry who get first look deals. There are some folks in our industry who get multi film deals, right? That give them the ability to, excuse me, that give them the ability to take a breath, yeah, after a particular project recharge and then move on to the next thing mm -hmm. um you and i know that the majority of people in the film industry particularly people of color don't get those opportunities right so sustainability for me you know also you know looks like figuring out you know am i gonna am i gonna teach eventually one day right like i'm i'm working with an i'm working with an editor right now who teaches part-time at columbia Right. So he does a semester of teaching. Atlanta is really fabulous. I think you will like it. What teaching? Yes. Oh, I'm not sure. I see. I'm the kind of teacher who would get fired though. Right. No, no, no. I, no. I would tell everybody that you have to put your phone away. You have to you, nobody's allowed to be on the internet. You know, like I would I would I'd okay, be that's gonna be, the routers that is, in my, that's, in gonna my room. that's gonna be tough. Yeah. That, that's I mean, gonna be tough. Because because I, I just I, I I think that you have to be in the room to be in the knowledge. Um, but you know, so for me, the sustainability is something that I'm that I think about on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. You know, again, right now, like for me, you know, I, I have to deliver this film in the spring. Um, and before I deliver this film, I have to have my next one lined up. Yeah. So I'm hustling in that, you know, I'm hustling yeah. all the time. Yeah, it sounds like um uh you know, freelance. You Basically know? it is. Yeah. That's, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. It is, it is a, it is a freelancer's life. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I was hoping you were going to say something different. No, no, I know. I mean, you know, it's, it's so, it's so funny. I see all these things about me on the internet. I'm like, that's not true. <laughs> I'm like, who said that? Yeah. You're like, like really now? I'm like, oh, I, I, I really? You think where did you? Or I meet, or I bump into people who I haven't seen in a couple of years, and they're like, oh, I heard you moved to LA, and I'm like, I live in Queens. <laughs> I live in Queens. I'm still, I'm still, you know, in the same apartment I've been in for 15 years. Like, I, you know, it's, but, but I belong to the Directors Guild of America. I think that one of the one of the things that I did that I'm glad that I did was when I became eligible to join the DGA. I joined the DGA. So I have a way of getting health insurance now. Yes. Before that, you know, it was health insurance to my partner's employer. But, you know, when, when she left there, it was like, Ooh, how are we going to get health insurance? So, so I'm, I'm fortunate enough to be able to, to, to belong to that union um, and to have the, the collective bargaining power of the DGA mm -hmm. um, help set the help, help set baseline terms of, of my mm -hmm, contracts mm -hmm, when I mm -hmm. get hired. Right. Um, but otherwise it's the freelancer's life. 
Yeah. Um, outside of the project that you're mentioning, are you getting into directing episodics? I did read that, so I'm just- Yes, so I, I was um, lucky enough to, so Lil Lily Wachowski, um, who is, um, you know, um, one of the creators of The Matrix um, was the showrunner of a of a comedy series on, on Showtime called Work in Progress, um, mm -hmm. and she hired me to direct two episodes uh, on that show, and it was a great experience. I loved it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it was not hard. I mean, I, it's so funny. Um, documentary documentary is hard, right? Because you don't know what's going to happen. Right. Scripted, you know what's going to happen, and I was like, why is everybody like? Why is everybody freaking out about this scripted thing? It's like I know what's going to happen, like. <laughs> You know, it's like, like everything else is, is, is everything else is like butter because I know exactly what's going to happen here, you know, and, yeah. and you have, obviously you have creative choices to make. You have to make your days. You can't go into overtime. You have to avoid meal penalties. If the trucks don't show up, even though they're only three blocks away for five hours and you have to, you know, get all your shots in in 45 minutes, you know, or else like you're, you're screwed and it's not your fault, but it'll be your fault. You have to learn all of that stuff. Um, but I'm trying to do more episodic work as well, um, but it's a very competitive field. Um, mm -hmm. and, and a lot of what happens is that, you know, I, I do a lot of interviews with people who, mm -hmm. um, you know, who can't quite imagine or who actually haven't seen Strong Island. Mm. So, so they can't quite imagine how I would direct. And it's, I'm like, no, but you should just wait, watch like five minutes of the film. Just watch mm -hmm. like five, 10 minutes, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but I'm still I'm still working at, at carving out a, a, a niche for myself in the scripted world. We'll see how it works. Okay, all right. Um, well, we are uh, we have come to the end. So I, have um, I think more. it is oh, possible. Wait, you have one more thing. Okay. Yeah. What, your your advice to emerging filmmakers right now. That's right. So my advice to 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 all of you um, is to work together. Right. That's my advice. Like, because, you know, it's one of the things that was built into, and I know it's built into the third world newsreel workshop, right. Is this collab, is this niche, this collaborative nature. Mm -hmm. But I think that what, what people have to do, especially, you know, filmmakers who are coming from backgrounds where you don't have your parents' money to make a movie, or you don't have, you know, your inheritance to buy a camera, pool your resources, show up for one another, you know, like just if you, because I am a five minute film as a calling card can be made so easily if all of you work together, right? Mm -hmm. If you, if somebody, somebody has access to something, someone has access to something else. And before you know it, you have the base, like you have the basic stuff that you need to make a movie. Even if you're talking about making a movie on your phone, yeah. right? Don't forget about, um, uh, what's the Soderbergh? Um, is it um, High, Flying, High Flying Bird? Yes. High, yes, Flying, High Bird Flying Bird on Netflix was shot yes. by Steven Soderbergh on a cell phone. Right. Right. So, so my advice is to figure out a way to, to do the work that you want to do as soon as you can and support each other, come up with a pod, even if it's only two other people, come up with a pod and figure out a way to do the work that you want to do. Because the sooner you have work to show, the sooner you'll create more opportunities for yourself. And also the more you work on stuff, even if it's just like a fake commercial, you right? Build, the you more you the work muscle. on stuff, the more you learn. Exactly. It is the muscle memory of filmmaking that only gets developed by doing. So yeah. my advice to you is to do as much as you can figure out between your phone and your laptop how you can edit and shoot material. And even if you are working by yourself, figure out, you know, figure out what it means to have an A storyline and a B storyline and a C storyline, right? Figure out what it means to, you know, like read books like Save the Cat, right? Which is, which is this book about screenwriting. Just read it just so that you know that when people are listening to you pitch, they're going to be thinking about the structure in Save the Cat, mm -hmm. right? So, and, and, and also so that you know the structure that you break, right? Because when you break structure, it's, it's important to know that you're doing it on purpose, right? right? 
Um, but I think that more than anything else, you have to do, 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 do as much as you can practice as much as you can. That is my advice. That is wonderful advice. I remember hearing an interview with the three amigos. What mm -hmm. is that? Um, Enurito. Um, yeah. Um, I can't. Uh, Guillermo. De, de Toro, right? Yeah. Guillermo de Toro and Alfonso Caron, right? Yes. And really, it's like when one got a job, they brought the other one on. Right. They, you know, hey, I need help. You know, I need help with my friend, with my film. No problem. Hey, can you look at this cut, this, that, and the other? And like one of the things that I started to do with the students is like, you know, like look to the right, look to your left. This is your cohort. These are the people that you're going to be making films with. These are the people that you're going to call when you're like, I got fired. Do you have anything? And they're going to like, yep, come on. And, or they're going to be like, I got it. <laughs> you know, everybody right. gets a job on this film, right? right. So right. like, this is your cohort. And all you're going to do is look to start to continue to expand it. But right. this, like the people that you do TWN network um, workshops with, that's your cohort. Yep. That's your core, you know, your core base, right? Yep. And then you want it to continue to expand it. So thank you so much about that. Um, sure. Because you start, if you were people who are really digging down, like how are people really making this work? Yep. That's how they're doing it. That's right. And when it gets a job, everybody eats you know, right. and like people swallow their ego. Yeah, everybody on this shoot is actually a director, but you know what? Um, I can be a PA. Yeah, no problem. So I started out as a PA. Yeah. I started out as a production assistant, picking up bales and driving a van. Like that's how I started. And, I can drive a 15 I, pass no, now. I'm not afraid and, to drive and, that 15 and, pass. Right, exactly, exactly. You know how to, you, you know that you're not supposed to make a U turn in a 15 passenger van, like bottom line. Um, I, I know how to drive one. Um, I would still pick up bagels and drive a van today mm -hmm. if that's what I needed to do to, to get my work done. Um, yeah. But I think that there's, that there's so much to be said for finding a group of people that you trust, developing relationships, not letting those relationships go just because the workshop ends, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and really, asking yourself in, in a serious way, why not me, right? Because all these other folks who are making movies, they don't question whether or not they have the right to make a movie, whether or not someone's going to be interested in, in it, whether or not, you know, they get to, they get to be the one who gets to be in front. Mm -mm. Those folks don't doubt the, the right that they have to tell stories for a second. And I think that and the gumption, to... because you like see their work and you're like, this is terrible. Right, exactly. But their gumption about like, oh, but I can do this. And you're like, but you can't because I saw your work before. It's right. terrible. But then we we shrink. Focus, Focus on you. You cannot, yeah. you cannot ever shrink from the fact that you have as much a right to make a movie as anybody else. And it can be you. That's the answer. Why not me? It, the answer is it can be you. You decide, you make that decision for yourself. Nobody else should make that decision for you. Absolutely. That's great. Thank you. And the other part of it is that we have so many stories that haven't been told. That's we right. We actually don't have stories that have been told. And so they're waiting to be told. Yes. And I was also encourage everyone to film their families. So, because those right. are part of the hidden histories that we have. Absolutely. That's right that documentation, you know, through our personal histories. That's right. All right. Well, always, thank you always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Thank you. So great. Thank you, Yancy. Thank you, Anjanette. And thank thanks everyone for joining in tonight. Um, and remember, we still have another seminar next week. We're having funders come, New York State Council of the Arts, Way Farm, and the Jerome Foundation are going to talk about what they're looking for and what opportunities are up. And, uh, and our 2023 TWN workshop, production workshop application will be out very soon. So keep your eyes open for that. Um, Yancy, always wonderful to hear you talk and, uh, and your films are just wonderful. So everyone, you. if you haven't seen them, 
see them. The streaming for Color of Care continues till the 13th. And as you saw, you can still see Strong Island and we highly encourage you to do if you have not done so already. And, uh, and Jeanette's working on a film that's gonna be out soon too. Amazing. And uh, thanks everyone. And yeah. good Thank you, JT. Always good to be here. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Good night.